you're talking about the difference between like the agreeableness and the uh, conscientiousness and all that. Is are those more hardwired into who you are, or if someone realizes, oh, I'm way too agreeable or I'm way too conscientious, are there kind of you know thought processes you can have or practices to to do well, to try to improve that? There's this psychologist named Jerome Kagan, and um, he's a was he's an older guy now. Um, he was a was a very famous developmental psychologist, and he was interested in studying what he who he called inhibited children, temperamentally inhibited children, and those were probably introverted kids with high levels of neuroticism, and you could pretty much detect them by six months of age. They're the ones that would startle more easily. If they started to cry, it was harder to soothe them. They were more uh, they were more reactive to strangers, and when they were a little older, he used to do things like have them stand by their mom and roll in a like a little robot and watch how the kids reacted. And some kids would go and just play with the robot right away and others would hide behind their mother's legs and, you know, be cautious and then come out. What, what Kagan found was that if you had a temperamentally inhibited child and you encouraged their exploratory activity, you could shift them up into the normative range over a number of years. And so, and so that, that's a good example of the role of, of the environment in, in, mo- in modifying the initial temperamental predisposition. So you can imagine, imagine a normal distribution. So you could be anywhere from mm-hmm. very low to very high. And then imagine you sort of have a place on that at birth. It's a place that's, bl- it's, a, it's a fixed point with a blurry surround. And then the environment can move you to the more inhibited or to the less inhibited side. So you could be, you know, you, you're born somewhat extroverted. Your environment could make you really extroverted or less extroverted. The question is how far you can, be, can you be moved? And the answer is that's proportional to the effort that's put in. So with twin studies in IQ, for example, imagine you, you take twins and you separate them at birth and you put them in different homes. And then you look at their IQ. If I remember correctly, I think I've got this about right, that you, you need a three standard deviation difference in socioeconomic conditions to produce a one standard deviation difference in IQ. So let me, I'll try to make that more easily understandable. So, and I'm going to get the details wrong because I can't do the math, the statistics quickly enough in my head, but it's close enough. To move someone from as intelligent as a high school student to as intelligent as a college student, which is uh, a 15 percentile improvement, you'd have to move them from the 5th percentile in socioeconomic status to the 95th percentile. So it's a huge movement. So you can change IQ, but it's, but it's very, very expensive. And the more you want to change it, the more expensive it gets, and you run into the problem of diminishing returns. Can you change it on a case-by-case basis, or are you saying that within a group of a certain socioeconomic level, that will be produced? Because I feel like, I I don't think that what you're saying is if we took a, a... a because poor child and put him in the, a rich family that, that that child's IQ is going to be higher? Yes, no, that is what I was saying. saying. Okay. Exactly that, yes, exactly that. But, but the effect isn't as dramatic as you might think. And with adopted out children, the IQ of the adopted out children is much more like their biological parents than their adoptive parents. So IQ is really heavily influenced biologically. This and, was in the bell curve too, and that author yeah. was blasted. Yeah, well, you know, IQ, man, that's a tough subject. It's a dismal science, that. But I I can tell you some things about IQ. First of all, it is measured more accurately and more reliably than any any other phenomena that social scientists have ever measured. And it was invented or discovered by the people who invented all of our statistics. So you don't get to be a social scientist and say, I don't believe in IQ. But I believe in all these other things we've demonstrated statistically. You can't have both those claims simultaneously. And then IQ is actually pretty simple to measure. So all you have to do to measure IQ is, Matt, you could go, you could make an IQ test quite rapidly. You just go online and uh, get a list of, of words, like make a multiple choice vocabulary test with words ranging from simple words to complex words, and then collect 30 general knowledge questions and 20 mathematical, simple arithmetic uh, equations and just ask people to solve them. And then what you do is total the correct answers and rank order them. 
that's basically IQ right there. And now you correct it for age because you do that with IQ, but basically the average of any, the, the total score of any set of questions that assess the ability to abstract will give you a proxy for IQ. One of the things so, that people, oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. No, no, no. Well, and then, then the, the harsh thing about that, the harsh thing about that is that it turns out to be a very good predictor of life success, right? That, and especially in complex jobs. So that's rough. That's where I was headed. Um, so, so those two things combine into a very tough reality, right? One, your IQ test, it's true, right? Take that and, and you're stuck with you know, your actual IQ. It's easy to measure. Two, that's a very good predictor of how successful you'll be. And you said it in complex jobs, I'm sure you're right, but he made an argument that it applies to every job, that a waitress with a higher IQ will be much better at her job than a waitress with a lower IQ. He said that a construction worker with a higher IQ will get injured less frequently than a construction worker with a lower IQ. They just see a step ahead and they do this better. That like an IQ test would be a great job application, even more so than perhaps the traditional applications we use now. This well, guy made everything a, about IQ and then um, he even went as far as to like IQ rank different races and, and how, you know, the, the success of different races corresponded with the IQ test results of different races. And they hated that, but it was the data. I don't, don't Jewish people have like a 15% on average higher IQ? It's, it's 15 points. It's more than 15%. <laughs> it's 15 points. So what Thank that you. means is the average. We're getting blown out. <laughs> the average Ashkenazi Jew, so that's your Jews with European heritage, the average IQ for an Ashkenazi Jew is 115 compared to 100 for, for you know, other Europeans. And that is enough to account for the vast overrepresentation of Jews among high-end intellectuals and in complex jobs. Yeah, it's a major deal. And it's another one of those things that you don't get to talk about. I mean, IQ is rough. I, like, it, it's even it's worse, say. So, well, so first of all, in, in jobs that you can learn by rote, IQ predicts how fast you learn the job, but it doesn't predict how well you do it once you learn it. Conscientiousness starts to be a better predictor there. Mm -hmm. But um, here's an ugly little fact for you. This is a hate fact for sure, man. <laughs> so, you know, the U.S. Army has been using IQ tests for like 100 years, you know, and has done some of the mm -hmm. basic research. And... Uh, it wasn't very long ago, I don't remember exactly when this legislation came into being, but it is illegal in the United States to induct anyone into the armed forces if they have an IQ of less than 83. Okay, and that's because the armed forces have determined with extensive testing and desperation that there's nothing that someone with an I, somebody with an IQ of 83 can do in the armed forces that isn't counterproductive. The Force <laughs> Gump Amendment. Right, well, <laughs> and now, now you, it's really worth thinking this through because... The first thing you have to understand is that the, the armed forces actually wants people because they're chronically short of them. And so they're not inclined to get rid of people unless they have to. So they're motivated in the right direction to actually rely on the truth to guide them, right? Because if the truth mm -hmm. tells you what you don't want to hear, well then, um, yeah. you know, you're not going to be inclined to listen to it. But these guys want people, and if, the, if their results... They wish they could deny it. Yeah, if they could they get away with 77, exactly. they'd do it. That's yeah. exactly it. That's exactly it. Okay, so you think, well, 83. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. How many people have an IQ of 83? Well, it's like 10% of the population. Now, you just let That's that more think. than I would have thought. Yeah, no kidding. Well, okay, and they, 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 there's been, basically, the evidence suggests that if you have an IQ of 90 or less, which is substantially more than 10% of the population, it's very difficult for you to develop literacy levels that are sufficient so that you can read instructions. Imagine that's the basic metric for literacy. You can read instructions and, and you can follow them. Sorry, just, just give me one sec, mm -hmm. guys. Yeah, so you can read instructions and follow them. That's your basic, that's your basic guideline for literacy, but under 90 you can't do that, and that's more like that's more than 15% of the population. That's approaching one in five. So that's pretty damn terrifying. And, and especially as our society gets more complex because there's going to be fewer and fewer jobs. Yeah, I hate so to that's put down why the armed forces, are... but I think of, 
the elites is not typically the people that fill it out, right? You know, it, it, so maybe they ha only 80% of the population because of this IQ qualification is eligible. There's probably 20, 30% who self, you know, I don't know, pull themselves out of the pool just because they have other opportunities that don't include the army. You know, they don't uh, you're saying, you're saying that the pool of entry to the military might have a lower IQ on average uh, than the general population. It's hard. It's it's not fun to say, but well, yeah. what you're saying if is you're it's not a great a idea to family, join the army. So probably not a no, genius. A lot of that's not what I'm it. saying. I'm saying that like you know you should the, the, you should say that. Okay, high socioeconomic groups are not our warrior class, right? Our warrior class right, doesn't right. come from the millionaires of this world. It comes from mm -hmm. the people who maybe need that um, the GI Bill, right, to pay for college. It comes yep. from people you know who, who maybe don't have a lot of other great job opportunities. They look at the military. And, you know, I, I feel like sometime afterwards, they reverse engineer their reasons to say patriotism and love of America or whatever. But, you know, before they got in, a lot of it was about like, well, fuck. free college for a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, free clear free water, college is one or just like it's been, an explicit, it's been an explicit aim of the U.S. military, especially in peacetime, to, to be an uh, agent of social mobility. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong in pointing that out at all. I mean, part of what the armed forces do is to try to take people out of the, uh, what would you say, the, the, what's the word? It's not lower class, it's the underclass, the underclass, and move them up the socioeconomic hierarchy so that they can have functional lives. And that's a pretty decent job for the military in peacetime mm -hmm. in particular. And so I don't think it's unreasonable to point out that that's often a motivation for people. I mean, it, the military does attract more conscientious types, and also people who are lo low and more low in lower in openness, and so they're more likely to be kind of conventionally patriotic as well. But the the comment you made about, you know, perhaps the distribution of intelligence among the applicants is skewed towards the lower end. That that may be true, but it doesn't matter because the the fifteen percent figure I used, or ten percent figure for below eighty three, that's in the general population. Well, what that's I was not saying, the, oh, wow. it, yeah, that's in the general population. Yeah, yeah. I would be interesting to see what the U.S. military numbers of are like. Like, what percentage of U.S. military applicants fall fall into that range? What, that would be what kind of jobs? That very that's telling. where I'm headed, right? If 15 percent of the general population isn't smart enough to be in the military, I wouldn't be shocked to hear 25 percent of the applicants weren't smart enough because right. a lot of people at the high end, mm -hmm. you know, people who are otherwise like mommy and daddy can easily afford their schooling all the way through the master's degree level. Those people weren't going to join the army, and I think, and 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 because of that, I feel like that that if you are an outlier, if if you are a literal genius, and your aspirations are military, wow, the doors are open, eh? If if you yeah. go in there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you're mm -hmm. scoring thirty five points higher than the mean average, and they're like, oh, well, we're going to find something special oh, for you to do, well, young there's man. There's no doubt about that. They're, then they're very good at that. Like they, they don't they they do a pretty decent job of not wasting talent. You know, and the the military is very good at assessing aptitude, and and they do utilize it. So that's wonderful. But the the terrifying yeah. thing here is that this is especially terrifying, given what's coming down the pipes. You know, so the Tesla people, for example, are working pretty damn hard on really functional autonomous cars, and the most common occupation exactly. in the United States is driver for men. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And so, and then the other issue is, well, you know, the for the liberals. The only reason that people, let's call them left, left leaning people and leave the poor liberals alone, because I actually happen to be a liberal. So, but let's on the radical left, the idea is, well, the only reason that people are at the bottom is because of the oppression of the, of the, you know, of the patriarchal elite. And for the conservatives, it's, well, there's a job for everyone is if you just get off your damn ass and go look for one. But the reality of the situation is, is that as our society becomes more complex, Jobs for people at the lower end of the cognitive distribution are getting pretty damn hard to come by. And that's a and that's a social problem that no one will contend with because we can't have an honest discussion about IQ. And I, I can understand it. IQ, man, it's it's rough. It's rough. It hurts your feelings. It does. Yeah. It hurts your feelings. How do it, it how do people it, dance around that in academic circles? Like the whole difference in races or gender distribution differences, or is it just kind of ignored or, or spoken away Someone or yells other people eugenics who take it. and then they drag you out of the room yeah you don't know it's just it's just well for example there, there there are 
there was an absolute dearth of, of courses on intelligence in psychology graduate schools. You know, and I have colleagues who say, well, I don't believe in IQ. It's like, well, you know, it's not like the, it's not like the genie under your bed. You don't get to not believe in it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't believe I mean, in it. This isn't gender press. we're talking about. <laughs> no. This is a yeah, real thing. That's, yeah. that's, I know that you yeah, can measure right. it. Yeah, I, I did, but I don't yeah. believe in bench press. Sorry. Yeah, so, but, <laughs> uh, but the thing is, I, understand, I know the intelligence literature extremely well for, for a variety of reasons, partly because I tried to design tests of cognitive ability that weren't precisely IQ tests. I, but I, what I learned was that that was actually impossible. It took me 10 years to learn that. I got very educated about IQ while doing it, but I was trying to expand the domain of cognitive tests using neuropsychological tests that medical doctors had designed to assess brain damage. Would somebody with a higher IQ have learned that faster? <laughs> I, I, worked with, I worked with some graduate students who were smarter than me, and it took them quite a long time to learn this. <laughs> it might be the opposite, you know. If if you have a 150 IQ over there, and I think you do, it, you're gonna have. It might be uh, difficult to to sometimes to understand someone or or to to understand the the inner thinkings or inner workings of personality stuff and the the biology that affects someone with an 87 IQ. Oh, it's really hard. Like, I, I have an a advantage over many academics because I'm a clinical psychologist and I've had clients who had IQs in that range. And, you know, you just cannot believe how difficult things are for people like that. So I had one client, I mean, he had lots of problems, but he was, he was about three quarters deaf and he'd been bullied and like, he had lots of problems, man. And, but I tried to find employment for him, which was extraordinarily difficult. Even finding a volunteer job is, finding a volunteer job is actually harder than finding a job because you have to go through so many police uh, um, screens and that sort of thing now. So it's very, very hard. But um, I tried to, so he got a job stuffing envelopes. You know, he had to fold up letters and put them into envelopes. But imagine the envelopes are stacked and all the addresses in order and the pieces of paper are stacked and all the addresses are in order. Well, first of all, you have to not make a mistake because if you get one out of order, you screw up the whole thing. Second, you have to be able to fold a piece of paper with incredible accuracy to fit it into an envelope well enough so you don't crumple the envelope so that it doesn't jam up the automatic sorting machines. Right? You have to be within a tolerance of about less than a millimeter per fold. It took me like 30 hours to train him how to fold a piece of paper in three so that he could manage it. And then it was complicated by the fact that wow. on these pieces of paper, there was a, sometimes a photo was stapled and the photo wasn't always in exactly the same place. So then he had to make a decision about how to fold up the paper so he didn't crumple the photo so that it would still fit in the envelope. I mean, it was just, he sweated blood, man, trying to, and that was a volunteer job at a charity and they were going to fire him. So oh, what is the, what's the kind of solution for these, you know, 15% of people with these kind of debilitatingly low IQs is there a job that they can do, like service industry, or just any, or is it, are they kind of almost not? We have a lot of uh, wildfires they can't even apply. out west. Well, you know that, that that's an think. open social question, and as the as the as the uh, Silicon Valley geniuses keep complexifying our life, um, that problem is going to become more and more, more and more paramount. Exacerbated. It's coming yeah. it, every day. It's it's worse and worse. If you if you rewound 150 years, fill that. All of those guys with those 87 IQs, first of all, they're not that far below the standard deviation anymore. And second of all, like those are railroad workers. Those are farmers. They're, they, don't, they don't need to fold anything to a millimeter. They need to hit that railroad spike hard all day. And, and that was a good paying job. I, I feel like all of those manual labors, man muscle, the, the, the jobs that took advantage of the fact that a man was more muscular and physically powerful, like 85% of those are gone. And... and uh, Even when, that, though, like, you if, you're, the... if you're really, really dumb as far as IQ is concerned and someone tells you, all right, you need to fence in this whole pasture, put in a gate over there, do this, that, and the other thing, feed the animals, you know, raise a barn. Like, it seems like like that's just a different kind of intelligence, but someone with 83 doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, I get how to hammer things, so this will be easy. Well, the, you issue, know? Is, the issue is really um, r rapidity of adaptation to change. Eh? So... IQ is an excellent predictor of how fast you learn something. It's, it's a better predictor of how fast you learn something than how well you do at your job. But a lot of occupations, especially in more traditional societies, were, well, you learn the routine and then you repeated it. And so once you learn the routine, IQ, it's IQ independent to a large degree. Now, not, if, not if a problem emerges, but let's say under normal circumstances. But 
the problem now is that, you know, even if you're pretty damn cognitively sharp, it's hard to keep up. I mean, damn computer changes on you every day. And, you know, it's not, and it's also obvious that people who are computer literate, I mean, in our society, being intelligent and computer literate is a multiplier that's almost beyond belief. Mm-hmm. You know, I know guys who run whole enterprises that would have, should even now, probably employ a thousand people, and they're basically running it all by themselves because they're so they're so unbelievably efficient with computer utilization, and that's a that's a cognitive multiplier. But it's still almost all the benefits accrue to the smartest people because they're the ones who can use the technology the best. You have to be on the bleeding edge, you know, to really gain the economic advantage. I'd like to talk about gender gra- uh, gap in a moment. I got to do a quick advertisement read, but um, but that's something that we we touch on a lot here, and uh, and I think that you lay it out better than anyone I've ever heard. 